So I'm here in the courtyard of Keeble College at the University of Oxford, which one of it, with one of its own, who happens to be working in the Department of Physics in the building, just kind of diagonally across the courtyard from us. You can't see it, but uh, we thought we'd take the opportunity on this burgeoning spring day, it's not quite spring, to get some green in, in view here. Uh, with Thomas Williams, who is a postdoctoral researcher who deals with nearby galaxies. And Tom, when we say nearby, what do you mean? Uh, so we mean galaxies that are between 5 and 20 megaparsecs, is Me what I work on. Megaparsecs. So translate that for, for the... Uh, so kind of about 100 million light years. 100 million light years away. So just beyond the so-called local group of galaxies. Mm -hmm. That's right. And you've been pouring over data, doing data analysis from the JWST, the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, of 19 galaxies. And what did that tell you? You're part of a group called FANGS. If you could mm -hmm. tell us what FANGS is and what the, the galaxies yeah. that you analyze are telling us. So FANGS stands for Physics at High Angular Resolution in Nearby Galaxies. Um, and the idea behind that is to build this kind of multi-wavelength data set that will tell us about kind of the local conditions for star formation. So where are stars forming and how does the where you are in a galaxy change how the star formation is proceeding. And in our own Milky Way, we know that most of the stars form in the disk of the galaxy, correct? Yeah. But the news from this latest fang, these latest fangs operation, and you told me that fangs has been in existence it's a collegial effort by multi-institutions uh, uh -huh. uh, internationally. And you told me that the FANGS has been going since 2015, yep. and now it's using JWST data. Uh -huh. But the big news was what? The, that star formation is taking place not just in the disk? Yeah, so as well as star formation happening in the spiral arms, which are, you know, these very distinctive features of spiral galaxies, that's where they get the name from, um, that there are also these fainter kind of tendril-like things called spurs that come off of the, the spiral arms, and they kind of join the spiral arms together. So literally, if you can imagine, four spiral arms kind of wrapped around each other. These are like co-joining little, little what, uh, tendrils? Yeah, so they're, they're kind of these straight features almost that join between the spiral arms. And this was a complete surprise, right? You told, the, you told me that there have been hints of this, but uh -huh. that you and your group and James, w, James Webb has actually confirmed the existence of star formation outside the spiral arms. Yeah, so we had seen this in some other galaxies before, but, um, but what this sample of 19 has really shown us is that um, these spurs are pretty ubiquitous across the galaxy sample, but we see them in, in all kinds of galaxies. And it seems that there's star formation occurring in all of them. And that's a, is that surprising to you? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, we have this like historical view of star formation that most or all of the stars are forming within the spiral arms, but it seems like this new picture is emerging that rather than the spiral arms actually enhancing the efficiency of star formation, that really they're just kind of gathering gas together and apart from that not doing a whole lot. And initially the gas is atomic hydrogen then two atoms of hydrogen collide mm -hmm. create molecular hydrogen and then they we have dust that, that uh, comes from previous uh, core collapse supernovae and then we have these giant molecular clouds yeah. correct? Yep. Which are what about a hundred parsecs across or 300 light years? Or yeah about that kind of size. Okay and you, your thesis, uh, the title was interesting to me. Uh, the title of your thesis was what? It was Stars, Gas, and Dust at High Resolution in the Triangulum Galaxy. And the Triangulum Galaxy is, uh, is what? Uh, so it's uh, M33. It's a nearby, very nearby, kind of um, about 800 kiloparsec, so about you know a million and a bit light years away. Um, and it's the nearest spiral galaxy to us that is face on, um, and it's it's quite an interesting one. It's it's a bit unusual, but it seems to be kind of less evolved than other galaxies that are uh, close to us, and it has uh, much 
less defined spiral arm structure. So it's what's known as kind of flocculent or fluffy. Flocculent or fl fluffy. And you, you said even though we can't see all of the Milky Way because we're inside it, you think mm -hmm. that a Milky, our Milky Way is probably has more well-defined arms than, than the Triangulum Galaxy. Yeah, I, I think that's true. Yeah. And uh, so where does, what's next with this research? Um, so we, we now have our full set of 19 galaxies from the first year of JWST observations. Um, so we can now actually start to look at really cataloging the spurs between the spirals and, and seeing how star formation is going on in those. Um, we also have observations coming in now as part of the second year of JWST observations, which is another 55 galaxies. Um, so we've got about 15, I think, of those done so far and the rest will come in kind of the next six months or so. Um, so after that, we'll have this huge treasury of about 90 um, galaxies that we can really use to kind of pin down the youngest phases of star formation and, and see how things vary across the galaxy population. And I ask you, I said, do we understand, there's someone talking and just to our left, so forgive us for that. But I ask you, do we really understand spiral galaxies? Are we half the, are, are we, do we really understand the physics in spiral galaxies? And you kind of equivocated. Um, I think we're getting there. I think there's uh, definitely still work to be done about how um, kind of galaxies structure themselves and how that affects um, the star formation processes going on. But, um, but I think we're getting there. We definitely understand things a lot better than we did now that we have, you know, much bigger computers and much better data to kind of run simulations and check these against really, really good observations. So thanks, Tom, for your time today. Thank you. uh, fascinating work and good luck in the future. Thank you.